group of people. With the whole series of things, tapes and labor and rows and all the other things that are happening on my side, it once more is becoming a place for entertainment and theatre and art. But I think that is interesting and it really is something that's happening throughout the world. sorts of evidence remaining from the time that we can draw upon. Um, in terms of visual sources, there is of course the very rich uh, uh, source of Elizabethan and Japanese portraiture. Absolutely crucial. Just the observation of the decision and such detail. And it's sort of experimental approach to the study of history of dress. And I think that's the globe. Um, this building is a copy, it is not the original. The original was built in 1599 uh, and it was about 250 meters away in that direction but the original was built by William Shakespeare where this one was completed in 1997 and was built by an American. Sam Wanamaker, an American actor, came over to London in 1949 in search of the original site of the globe and he collects money by getting donations so these are the names of the people who gave money to build the theatre. And it took 27 years, started in 1970. Uh, construction really got going in the 1980s, and then it got finished by 1997. Sam Wanamaker died in 1993, so he never saw the building complete himself. But it's here because of him. Now, the building is constructed using the same building materials that Shakespeare used 400 years ago. So everything you see there is made exactly the same way as the original. It's all handmade. So the bricks are Elizabethan bricks made exactly the same way they did it 400 years ago. Uh, all the wood is hand cut. Uh, the nails are hand forged. The walls are lime plaster. The thatch is the same, Norfolk water reed. So um, all of it is to try and be as authentic as possible. But before we go in, we need to talk about London. Uh, but uh, where you're standing is, was not London when Shakespeare was alive. This was the parish of Southern. London was on that side of the river only. And it was um, a small, small little uh, city managed by a lovely group of people called the Puritans. Protestants, very hard working, very religious, but no fun. So you weren't allowed to have any fun in the city of London. So people had fun over here. And there were lots of fun things you could do. Four theatres, the Rose, the Swan, the Globe and the Hope. But if you don't like theatre, that's okay. You can enjoy bear baiting. And the Puritans don't want anyone having fun. In the 1640s, the Puritans cancelled Christmas, just to give you an idea of how fun it's got. <laughs> but why did the Puritans open that, um... Anyone? You know, I'll tell you what, we'll go inside, because there's a sort of big clue inside. Thank you. 
we have electricity. So we do shows at 2 o'clock and 7.30 in the evening. Um, but we only open from the 23rd of April, and we keep going until the middle of October. Sometimes in London it rains. The good thing is, uh, we don't stop the show, no matter what the weather is doing. 600 people stand, 900 people sit down. 600 people that are standing get wet. You're not even allowed an umbrella. But we will sell you a plastic bag with a hole for your face, uh, two pounds. Little poncho, it's cute. What we've done here is we've recreated the globe as close to the original as possible. So everything you see here is original factors, all made of oak. It's held together with oak panels, and this is green oak. This means the wood is fresh when it's constructed. Once you put it together, the wood shrinks, tightens up the joints, and the building becomes strong. One of the side effects, of course, of using this is cracks, cracks in the timber. So you see lots of cracks all over the place. Um, I'm told that this is perfectly safe and that you're in no danger whatsoever. However, if you do start taking the pegs out, the building will fall down. And the original globe was not a brand new building. It was a theatre called The Theatre, which was built in 1576, north of the city walls. Shakespeare started his career in that theatre. It was stripped down and re-erected on this side of the river and called the Globe in 1599. Uh, archaeology in, in the car park gives us enough information about the dimensions. It's 99 feet across and it's a 20-sided building. We don't know how the stage was decorated. We do know how the Swan Theatre was decorated because a Dutch politician called Johannes de Witt watched a play of the Swan in 1596. He drew a sketch in his journal and that's the only image we have of the interior of any of the buildings. So the gold, the marble painted on wood, and the Italian style, that was from the Swan. So it's now a composite of bits of information from relevant documents, etc., etc. But then when we were constructing it, we had other problems. In the walls, there is hair mixed into the plaster. So that's lime plaster. Mix some hair in, binds the plaster together, makes it nice and strong and flexible. Cows hair. But that was because back then cows were hippies and had long hair. And we don't use long-haired cows today because they're not very big. Now we used cashmere. Goat hair. Now, the public were a little bit different as well. They paid just one penny to enter the theatre. They got to stand in the yard. So the poor stood. If you want to sit down, you pay an extra penny. If you want to sit on a cushion, you paid an extra penny. So it was basically three pence, up to three pence, to sit in the galleries all the way up to the top. And then if you were rich, you could sit behind the actors. So in the gentlemen's rooms on the sides, the lord's rooms directly behind the actors. The same on the other side. The middle is the balcony of the musicians. They might have done some scenes up there as well. But just imagine a thousand people squashed in there in the middle of the summer, and none of these people have washed their clothes. The smell in the theatre is quite rich. But that was the smell of London, so the entire city smelled like this and people were used to it. But the poor do something extra special. They're all going to die from the plague, the pestilence. And they believe that if they chew garlic, they will be okay. So now you've got a thousand people chewing garlic. If it's a villain, Richard III, they're all going to go, boo. That's a thousand voices creating a wind of garlic which is now going straight up onto the stage. The actors did not like this one. And they had a name for the floor, and they were called Penny Stinkers. Because they stink. Now Shakespeare had a more polite term, brand names, and that's the term we use today. Right, why do we build a building like this? Well, very simple. Um, we want to recreate the environment in which the plays were originally performed. So, the big difference between this theatre and uh, any other theatre is that the actors can see the audience. To be! <laughs> or not to be. <laughs> that is the question. 
<laughs> pretty awesome, yeah? yeah that's pretty epic, fun, fun. Uh, What you've just witnessed is a man talking to himself. And everybody knows that's the first sign of madness. <laughs> Which is why a lot of people called him the Mad Prince of Denmark. He's not mad. He tends to be mad. People think he's mad, but he's not mad. And he certainly does not talk to himself. So he stands on the stage here in the globe, and this time around, though, he can see everybody. So when Hamlet starts speaking the words, to be or not to be, that is the question. Who is Hamlet talking to? The audience. Exactly. He's talking directly to you, the audience. And what he's doing is sharing his feelings with you, and nobody else in the play. Horatio, his best friend, is at the beginning, and only comes back at the end. He's not there for the bulk of the play, and that's the only person he could talk to. So he's on his own, but he shares everything with you. That's why you like him. You are talking directly to the audience, so you want to talk directly to individuals within the audience, one person at a time, because it feels more engaging. This is the point. Even when you're talking to one person, it makes it more exciting. So that's what it's about. It's about engaging the audience, and the audience will love it. And then, of course, you want people like you in the audience who talked back to the actors. And that happened all the time. They never shut up. <laughs> um, so as a result, there's an engagement going both ways. So it's actually interactive, and Shakespeare exploited this in Julius Caesar. Mark Anthony stands on the stage and he goes, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Who are the Romans? Of course, you are the Romans. He's written you into the play, and you are in judgment of these politicians who stabbed another politician in the back and are now telling you why it was a good idea. Sound familiar? So that's the point of going, oh, it's interaction, and that's what we are. In 1660, one of the most famous actors of the time, when they reopened the theatres, was Nell Gwynn, um, happened to be the mistress of Charles II. Possibly Charles II's love. Maybe one of the reasons why women became actors at the time. Um, but in fact, actually, we were the last country to introduce female actors in Europe. Um, but we're doing a play about Nell Gwynn. So it's a new writing play about Nell Gwynn in modern writing. And that will be coming on stream sometime during the summer.